just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Good morning, I greet you in the spirit of Christ. Today is not only Father's Day, happy Father's Day, Pops. Today is also Trinity Sunday. I'm not positive why the lections that the church chose to follow today explore wisdom literature, since in Hebrew scriptures, um, wisdom is always personified by women, and today is Father's Day, but that's okay. Uh, we can live with these issues without any problems. Wisdom literature is found like some of the other genres in our Hebrew scriptures. Um, we find it in many parts of the Psalms, the book of Job's, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, my favorite, the book of Proverbs. You'll also find those of us who argue that the book of James is a wisdom scripture and much of what Jesus says our lives are filled with much that we must contend on a regular basis. And sometimes all we're looking for is the immediate answer, and that's perfectly understandable. Life comes at us fine and quick, and we must make decisions. If we are to live in holy relationship with God, we would want to learn wisdom, however, that God gives us. So let's dive in and see where we find the Lord be with you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There's a story centuries old that I would share once upon a time, long ago and far away, because all good stories begin that way, don't they? There was a young couple, madly, passionately, divinely, chastely, purely, eternally in love with each other. The only thing to do at a time like that, of course, is for them to get married, which they do. Life was difficult in the land in which they lived, though. Everything that they tried failed. So as many generations had before them, they decided that the young man would go to a far country to seek his fortune. This had happened time and time again. He packed and he left. Eighteen long years later, he's ready to return home to the woman he loves. He's made a little money. He has a bag of copper coins, a bag of silver coins, and a bag of gold coins, and they can live now with this. By the time he gets back to their own land, the world has changed a little bit. Of course it has, it always does. The hamlet that he first comes to has now become a large market town, and he thinks, gosh, I've been away from the woman I love for 18 years. Maybe I should buy her something to take home to her. Every now and then, guys think about things like that. He looks around and he sees an older woman sitting against a wall. She's got a basket with a loaf of bread or three and a beautiful shawl. Would you sell me the shawl, he asks. She says, I don't sell shawls. Well, what do you sell? I sell wisdom. Wisdom. That's great. I could take some of that home. What could I get for a bag of copper coins? He puts it in her hand. She puts it in the shawl. She looks at him and says, always stay on the main road. Even though it's longer, it's safer. And he says, this is wisdom. And she smiles and says, you may find it useful. He says, well, well what then can I buy with a bag of silver coins? The transaction is made, and she says, everything that is called ugly is also beautiful. I'm not sure, he says. Maybe, maybe if I bought wisdom with gold, I would find something really important. So he gives the bag of gold, it disappears. She looks at him and says, beware of anger in the evening. Wait until morning. And he says, you've given me riddles, but I'm not Solomon. I can't unpack these. What on earth am I to do? I've lost 18 years of my life. He closes his eyes, turns around. He looks back, and the woman is gone. There's the basket with the bread and the shawl, but she's disappeared. He, he picks up the shawl, and out of it falls the three bags of coins. He's an honest man. He wants to return what isn't his. He asks the other merchants, and they laugh at him and say he's insane. There's nobody like that, never has been. So he pockets the coins, the shawl, takes the bread because he's hungry, and he starts his way home more. He meets up with a group of merchants who are traveling. They invite him to come and join them. He does. They share the bread. They share their stories. They come to a fork in the road. Some of them want to take the shortcut, and he remembers, stay on the main path. It may be longer, but it's safer. And he argues to stay on the main course, 
Eventually he's persuasive. They get to the next town and they discover that there is indeed a band of robbers and thieves who have set up an ambush on the shortcut. They have escaped with their possessions, their lives, and all of their fortune. They reward the man, our hero, with a small horse to ride and some money. He goes on his way. He comes to what had been a town and is now a kingdom city. And there should be order and prosperity, but there is violence and destruction. And there is no one who is respectful of anyone else. Is there no law? Is there no order? Is there no king, he asks. Of course there's a king, he's told. But the king has become an evil, horrible ogre. And no one's going to respect or listen to an ogre. The man sees the king, scales on his body, wild hair, his fingernails grown out like claws being pushed and shoved and mocked and indeed the king looks horrific but he remembers what he was taught and what the woman said as well and he says everything that is ugly is also beautiful and hey presto just like at the end of the Disney movie Beauty and the Beast the king becomes this incredibly tall handsome strong virile imposing figure because he has been loved simply for being himself and order is restored and there is peace and there is prosperity and there is goodness and the king rewards the young man with more riches and a carriage to ride home which he takes and he arrives late at night and decides I'll wait in the tavern overnight and I'll go see my wife in the morning he goes down to the common room for dinner there are wait people serving his wife is one of them but she ignores him and he thinks first of all how disappointing and he gets sad and as she ignores him more, he gets angry. And then he gets really outraged. Yes, it's true. Guys sometimes act this way. And he is absolutely livid. And he's going to denounce her before the entire town. And he stands up and the shawl falls out of his pack. And he remembers the words, Beware of anger in the morning. Wait until... Oh, anger in the evening. Wait until morning. And so he resolves to divorce her in front of everybody the next day. The next morning he comes down for breakfast. His wife comes to him and says, please excuse me, I hate to intrude. I apologize for staring at you last night, but you remind me so much of someone I knew once. You could be his twin brother. Who, who is that? It was the one love of my life, my husband, but he left 18 years ago. I've not heard from him in all that time. I'm sure that he must be dead but you don't forget the great love of your life. And the man apologizes for his own misthoughts, reveals who he is, that he's returned and with fortune, and they settle down as a happy middle-aged couple to rear their own family because stories like this always end the same way stories like this always begin, don't they? You can say it with me. And they lived happily ever after. Wisdom, says the Bible, may be found in unlikely places because God is willing to use every place there is to teach us wisdom. In the Proverbs, wisdom says she was the first of God's created things and it is through wisdom that God creates everything that is. In the Psalm we heard, we remember that we are created a little lower than angels. We are able to understand wisdom. We're able to accomplish its mission because God creates us in such an incredible fashion. Jesus reminds us that we will not learn wisdom all at once, but we have to spend time and trust in the Spirit and its instruction. Wisdom is personified and speaks to us through words that will give us life and holiness. Wisdom reminds us that it is more valuable than money, than power, than any relationship, because all of those things can be taken from us. And at some point, all of those things will be taken from us. And not money, not power, not fame, will help you get through the emotional trauma and stress of any of those losses. But God's wisdom does, anchoring you here among God's people. We may learn wisdom and discernment and strength. We may, but we're often distracted. 
C.S. Lewis writes in his book, The Weight of Glory, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are distracted by shiny objects, television, movies, Twitter feeds, Facebook posts. When learning wisdom requires concentration, time, humility, to listen to wisdom call and instruct, the story of the traveler may help. First, we stay on the main path. As you heard Jack Hinton a couple of weeks ago, we are Wesleyan Christians. For us, the main path is marked out by the four corners of Scripture, tradition, reason, experience. These four will mark for us boundaries where we may learn and grow. Scripture is vital. Memorizing Scripture is good, but it's not enough. We need to spend a lifetime learning how to apply Scripture because we grow and mature and change and the world around us changes as well. So the truth of Scripture must be allowed to reveal itself in today's world as well as the world in which we were born. Experience and tradition are the entirety of the church's history, all of her glory and her errors, all of her mistakes and corrections, and we spend time learning it. I know, you're thinking right now, how incredibly boring that sounds. But listen and talk to someone like Aaron or Tim, or ask Mary Grow, who's a good church historian in our congregation. There is so much for us to experience through it. Reason is probably as close an attribute as any comes to being wisdom. Reason allows us to make conclusions from incomplete information and project a future that might be. One of my favorite bumper stickers says, there are two types of people in the world. There are those who can make decisions based on incomplete information. <laughs> Second, we learn that whatever God creates is beautiful. Each and every one of you, every person you will encounter is the image and likeness of the God of all creation and you are created with worth and value and to be respected and cared for simply because you are. When our children gathered at Vacation Bible School, they represented all that we could be, tall and short and round and skinny and boys and girls and all the colors and they enjoyed each other because they had not learned the adult folly of trying to separate us into different pigeons holes. That behavior is sinful because that behavior always results in somebody's humanity being denied. We are created in God's image and wisdom and God's love and we reveal that to one another and we see it in each other. Third, don't be angry if the situation is unclear or confusing. Learn first as President Kennedy misquoted once upon a time, don't take down the fence just because you don't know why it's there. Take a deep breath and learn. Do not assume you know somebody's intentions or motives until you spend time with them. Spend more time trying to understand than being understood. Listen. Do not speak out in anger. Understand the situation the context, and the person. Ages and ages ago, Linda and I got married in October. That next June, we were at my parents' house over in Cooper Young. Dad and I were doing what guys do at times like this. We were trying to make sure the hamburgers didn't get burnt up on the charcoal fire. My father asked me, how do you like being married? I said, it's nice, it's different. And he said, it is. And we paused for a moment, and he took a sip from his Miller Genuine Draft and said, I'll tell you this, a little kindness goes a long way. Some of the wisest words that I've ever heard. Kindness comes when we pause, 
respond rather than react. All wisdom is given to us by God. I believe that we know wisdom best when we know Jesus best, for he is the source of wisdom that we have for us today. Knowing God is what we're ultimately after, and we know God best by knowing the Christ. We put ourselves in love with each other, not seeking to believe that wisdom will come merely with age, does not come simply from fame or money. It comes from spending time and soaking deep in the body of Christ, the church, from learning, from understanding and seeking spirit and sacrament, service and self-giving. And by the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed presence of the Holy Spirit, we will discover God's wisdom and walk slowly in its path. And because all good stories end the same way they end, you can quote the ending with me. Through all that comes your way, through all the upset and ups and downs, you will learn God's wisdom and live in God's love and peace. And all together now, and they lived happily ever after. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is Standing on the Promises, because we have God's promises to stand upon God's wisdom and God's presence. I invite you to stand and sing following our hymn. If you